I'm the local missions minister here at Weddington Methodist Church. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website for all the ways that you can get involved in missions and ministry here at Weddington. And now worship is about to begin. So grab your Bible, get comfortable, and let's worship God with passion together. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's stand and let's worship.
Psalm 30, 10 through 12. <coughs> Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning to dancing. You've taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let's lift our voices to the giver of life, to the giver of love. Everything that we have comes from the Lord. Let's worship Him this morning. I've searched the world It couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade, you never know. You came along, put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's no
Together this morning as the body of Christ, let's proclaim this Apostles' Creed. Let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let's turn to our neighbors and let's pass the peace of Christ this morning. Well, if you've not been welcomed this morning by our awesome hospitality team, good morning and welcome to Weddington Methodist Church. Uh, for those of you that may be worshiping with us for the first time, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, it's always our prayer that folks that are new here to the church feel at home and that you feel welcomed because you are welcome and that we all experience the power and the presence of the living God together this morning. God is at work all over the mission and ministry of this church. And the best way to find out a place to get plugged in, you can download our church app to your phone. You can go to the church website and, and find a place to join in mission and ministry where God is at work through our church here. Um, we're pretty excited. We have our silent witness uh, ministry. Um, we've got some new, new swag. You can't see it from my guitar strap, but I've got my Weddington shirt on today. Uh, I think Lindsay and Katie have their shirts on, the youth shirts. Yes, very nice. And uh, it's a great way to say, hey, I'm a Christian, and uh, I go here to church without saying it at all. You can proclaim the gospel without speaking a word. And I uh, encourage you to look into this. It's an exciting thing. We've got a lot of nice pieces of clothing uh, and coffee mugs and different things that you can go onto the website to find. Um, I'm super, super excited to let you all know that my sister in Christ, Joanna McCall, where, Jojo, are you in here? She may not be in here yet. She may be at the 930 service. Um, she has joined our church staff. Not only can she sing and dance, she's also a pastor now. She's going to uh, minister to our youth, and we are so excited to have her on the staff. If you don't know Joanna, she is just a gift. She's a true joy and uh, never sits still for a moment. Uh, when, you, when you meet her, you'll know that instantly. So we're so excited to have her on staff. Um, we had the consignment sale this weekend. We're very, very thankful and excited. The consignment sale is a time where the church can raise money, and I believe it typically brings in about twenty or thirty thousand dollars every time that we have it. So if you were involved with the consignment sale, if you'd like to raise your hand, we'd like to thank you uh, for your ministry here at the church. It's a lot of work. I've helped, and, uh, and it's just a great outreach and a great way to help people. Uh, so we're excited about that. So.
before we go any further, though, let's let's pray together. If you would pray with me, <clears throat> mighty God, there is nothing, nothing greater, nothing more mighty, no one more powerful, no one more loving than you. Nothing, Lord, is better than you. And we have gathered here, Lord, your children, your sons and daughters, as the body of Christ, to sing your praise, to hear your word proclaimed, and to tell you, Lord, that we love you, and to thank you for loving us. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and stir in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, stir our affections for you this morning, and use this time of worship to draw us closer to you and closer to each other. And Father, we're, we're able to come into this place and gather as the body of Christ freely, uninhibitedly. And we thank you for that freedom. And Lord, we pray your blessings on the men and the women that serve to protect that freedom. May you protect them as they work to protect our freedoms. And we pray your blessings on their homes. And Father, you've told us to love you above all else, but to also love each other. And we want to take just a minute and worship you by lifting up our brothers and sisters, by lifting up our family, our friends, our neighbors. So church, if there's anybody in your life that you'd like to pray for together aloud, let's take a moment, let's do that together. Let's worship God by loving each other, lifting each other up. Mighty God, in your, in your mercy, hear our prayer to you. Hear our cry to you. We put our trust and our hope and our faith in you. Whether that we're high on the mountain celebrating the victories and the joys and the celebrations of life, or whether we're trudging through the valley low, Lord, we know that you are right beside us, walking with us, molding us, shaping us into the sons and the daughters that you, would, you made us to be. And we thank you. And we ask these things, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue worshiping our God this morning through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. You know, everything that we have comes from the Lord. And when we give back what he so graciously given to us, we allow the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth. So as we play this next song, if you feel led to do so, please, you can bring your offering to the altar. You can give online, you can mail a check to the church, you can come by the church office, however you would like to do it. Let's continue worshiping God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. could sing you songs as I often do. Every song must end and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again so that I have is a heart Nothing. 
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up there and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got We are so blessed today to be celebrating the sacrament of holy baptism. And as I've shared with you before, I think this is one of the most beautiful things that we do in the life of the church. For when we join together and celebrate a baptism like this, we're, we're acknowledging that God's grace begins in our lives long before we are ever aware of it. We picture God's loving arms reaching down, and we see that in the Psalms when we hear that it was God who knit us together together in our mother's womb. And when God called Jeremiah, and Jeremiah resisted, saying, I'm way too young, I'm still in the youth program, then it was then that God said, but Jeremiah, before you were ever born, I knew who you were. While you were still in your mother's womb, I consecrated you. So today, we celebrate God's loving arms are reaching down. We're witnessing as a family comes before you, and they're reaching up, taking one of those hands of God, and they're vowing to raise their son in the Christian faith and life, and in the life of the church, so that he can be led to accept Jesus Christ as his own Savior and Lord. Then we as the church, we're going to reach up, take one of those other hands of God that's reaching down. We're going to join hands with his family. We, too, then are going to vow that we'll do everything that we can do to nurture this faith so that someday he will indeed accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So now I ask you this question. First, what name is given this child? Sawyer. Hi, Sawyer. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Ah, there you go. There's that smile. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask, do you repent of your sin? If so, please answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in his grace? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please answer, I do. And according to the grace that's given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church? And will you serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, please answer, I will. And will you nurture Sawyer and Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. If so, please answer, I do. I do. Very good. Well, hello. Wrinkle that nose. And now to you, the congregation, to you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm 
both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, please respond, we do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life? And will you include Sawyer now before you in your care? If so, please answer, we will. And let us pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful for your love and grace and a grace that is at work in our lives long before we are ever aware of it. And now we ask that you would bless this water and he who is to receive it, that it may be a sign of your love and grace now and forever in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Will you let me see you? Can I hold you? Well, hello, hello. Look at you. Look at you. Check it out. Oh, you want the microphone. There you go. I might need that. All right. Look at the water. Let's look over here. See this? No. <gasps> look at that smile. Too funny. Let's get over here for the pictures and out of moments. Ready? Sawyer, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the Spirit work within you that having been born through water in the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. All right. And will you celebrate this baptism in Christ? Good job. And let's sing together, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. We are also blessed today that we have a, a family joining our church as well, and and I think this is, again, one of the greatest compliments that we as a church can receive because this family is choosing us. They're choosing you. They're choosing us together to be their church, to be the family with whom they want to worship God, with whom they want to grow in their faith, with whom they want to uh, proclaim the gospel of grace and humbly serve and love. And we are just so thrilled to have before us Wes and Sarah with Eliza, Dean, and Claire Yes, what a beautiful family. Hey, guys. I see you hiding back there. <laughs> hello, hello. And so as they join our church, again, what a blessing it is to be receiving them. And so I ask you now these questions. And the first question is, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you put your whole trust in his grace? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please answer, I do. And as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, please answer, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend this family to your love and to your care. Will you now do everything in your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, to perfect them in love? If so, please respond, we will. And will you welcome your new family in Christ? It is so great to have you guys. And I invite you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We'll begin at verse 8. And I know that uh, Justin and others shared 
with all of those of you who are surviving the uh, consignment sale. Thank you for such an amazing ministry to all of you. Um, when you just hear about all the work that goes into it, but then the funds that are raised and the lives that are changed. We were, we were talking about it earlier. If we just see the faces of the lives that are changed because of such an amazing, hardworking weekend and weeks of work that went into it, thank you all for the difference that you make in the name of and on behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse... Eight, where Paul writes in his masterpiece to the book of to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 10 verse 8 but what does it say the word is near you on your lips and in your heart that is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved for one believes with the heart and so is justified. One confesses with the mouth and so is saved. And the scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. It's the same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But... How are they to call on one in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah said, Lord, who's believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for your holy word and for this opportunity now to study it together. And as I stand before these, your people, this is your church. So I pray that this will be your message and not my own in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The beginning of the year, we started looking at vision because our church turns 200 years old this year. So we're beginning a whole new season in the life of the church. And the question is, what is God's vision for the church? Because Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Where there's no prophecy, no word from God, where we can't see what God is doing, then the people will perish. So we began talking about being a discipleship academy making disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, there are three greats that drive our ministries and missions. And these are the great commandments. The first great commandment Jesus gave us is that we love God with everything we've got, with all our heart, soul, strength, and our mind. In other words, all in in our love for God. And as a church, we seek to be all in in our love for God. The second commandment is that we love one another that we love our neighbor as ourselves, that we show our love for God in how we also love others. And the third great is the Great Commission. The last thing Jesus said as he's ascending into heaven is he looked out at the disciples, he looked out at the church, and he said, go and make disciples. So we began to talk about then what does that look like to go and make disciples? And what does a disciple look like once that a disciple is formed? And so we talked about a disciple is one who loves God with everything they've got. We show our love for God by worshiping God with passion, by intentionally growing in our faith. And then we also love one another. And how do we show our love for others? We will show our love for others by proclaiming this good news, the gospel with grace, and by humbly serving in love. And discipleship, the sweet spot, is right there in the middle where these four come together, where we're loving God, we're loving others, we're worshiping God with passion, we're intentionally growing in faith, we're proclaiming the gospel of grace, and we are humbly serving in love. But today, I want us to focus on proclaiming the gospel 
with grace. What does it mean to love God and to love others by proclaiming this gospel? Now, proclaiming the gospel or the, the word evangelism has become kind of one of those scary words in, in our world today, sadly. I mean, I think it's sad that we've lost that word. It was a word that was such a powerful word, and, and we've lost it to our culture. We've kind of lost it to politics when people talk about the evangelicals or others. But, but actually, that word means good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, good news. Now, we have stereotypes now, though, when we think about evangelists. We think about door-to-door people coming up to your house, knocking on your door. And then you realize you're caught. You can't hide because now they know you're home. And, and then so you get this, if you were to die tonight, where will you be spending eternity? Right? You know, kind of like, you know, are you going to need air conditioning where you're going at the moment? You know, and it, it just kind of terrifies us a little bit. And, and we think about, you know, these groups that come to your houses now. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody came to my house, you know, here, came to love them to the door. And, you know, and, and they're, they're ready to talk, you know, and they're, they're complimenting. I love what you've done with your yard. Well, thank you. I work hard on the yard. You know, it's something I like to do. Yeah, thank you. You know, and they're going, so can, when you think about a kingdom, what do you think of? And I'm like, you guys are Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Yes, we are. And I said, appreciate what you do. You're welcome to talk to me as long as you want to talk to me, provided I get equal time. <laughs> and if I get equal time, then we can have this conversation because I've got a PowerPoint to die for. <laughs> right. Well, we can't stay, but so long, you know. So if, if you want to get rid of something quickly, you know, just go, you got a PowerPoint. But, you know, we just, we have these, these images of what does evangelism mean? Or we ride down the interstate and we see sometimes these billboards that are there and, and theoretically they're in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking sometimes when I read them and I see what they say and how they say it, I'm thinking that, that Jesus must be going sometime, please don't put my name on that. Sometimes we try to scare people to God versus open our arms of God's loving arms to receive them, to embrace them. What does it mean to proclaim the gospel, but to proclaim the gospel with grace? That word euangelion, that word good news or gospel, it, it also is the root word for angels. So you catch you and then angelion, the angelion, angelion. And so it's the root where you get the word angel, and an angel is simply a messenger of God, a messenger of good news. We saw that, for example, in Luke chapter 2, when the shepherds were abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, and the angel of the Lord appears before them. Glory of the Lord shines around them, and they're terrified, and the angel says, don't be afraid. I am bringing you, and the word is euangelion. I'm bringing you euangelion. I'm bringing you good news. I'm bringing you the gospel. It's good news of great joy. And it's for all the people. You see, to you is born this day in the city of David, your Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now, there's another couple words that, that tend to bother us in our culture today. And if we're not careful, the church has a tendency. We, we just struggle to react without overreacting. So we have a tendency to throw things out like the word saved and salvation and a savior that we need a savior. But, but what it means is, is that God is saving us from our brokenness, from our lostness, from our separation from God. I mean, when somebody's missing, think about this. If somebody goes missing, all of a sudden your phones will start making this loud sound and, and you know, you'll get this message that says that it's an amber alert, and that means there is a young person who is missing, and, and we're not stuck. Everybody pay attention. This was the last place they were seen. This was the kind of vehicle that they were seen. We need everybody watching because we're not resting until this person's found, right? Or a silver alert. Somebody's missing. Somebody that is loved by someone is missing. So everybody pay attention. Somebody loved is missing. 
And we were talking to our daughter just the other day, and as you know, you know, she is going to have our first grandchild. We've got a little girl coming in June, and we're all so excited, and she's so excited. And, you know, we're, I'm going to spoil her royally. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. And, and, you know, whenever we found out we were having one, Amazon goes, yes, because they knew. Watch this. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. We were so excited about it, and, and so, you know, my daughter is a nurse manager, and she was telling that the other day they had what's called a code pink. Have you ever heard of code pink? A code pink in a hospital means that there's a baby missing, that a baby is not where it should be. Someone's child is not where it was expected to be. And so when you call a code pink, the hospital locks down, the doors lock down, nobody gets to go out. You, the nurses will move to various assigned stations, stairwells are checked, everybody has an assigned place. And, and Ashley was telling us that when this code pink occurred, which had happened before, but she said now, now that she has a little one moving inside of her, she said it evoked all kinds of different emotions. She said, all of a sudden, I had tears coming down my face with this code pink going on in the hospital. Because I couldn't imagine how terrified somebody must be that their precious child is missing. Now, friends, I tell you that story for this because that is exactly how God feels. Our whole faith is God calling code pink because you and I are his children. And as his child, it terrifies God. It breaks the heart of God. But it terrifies God to think that one of his children is lost out there somewhere and we're not stopping until we find them. And God goes to this extraordinary measure then of, of as Paul says in Philippians, taking on human form to come and live among us so that he can make sure that he's talked to all of his kids, that we can understand what's going on. But he is so terrified at the thought of losing one of his children that he will actually die for that kid. And that kid's you. And that kid's me. But not only that then, God is depending on us to tell our family and our friends and our neighbors and all around us that God is so terrified of losing them because God loves them desperately. For God so loved the world. So when we read the scripture from Romans 10, I want you to hear Paul's passion because the church has got to regain its passion of loving others enough to share the euangelion, the good news, the gospel with the world. Listen to Paul's passion. Just go back to chapter, chapter 10 that we read, but verse 1. In verse 1 he goes, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is that they may be saved. Do you, do you catch that passion? Now, if that's not enough passion for you, back up one more chapter to Romans chapter 9, verse 1, and, and listen to Paul again. He goes, now I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. I mean, did you hear what he just said? If, if I became cursed by God, if that would allow you to be found by God, if that would lead you to a relationship with God, that I was cut off from him so that you would embrace him, I would do it in a heartbeat. Wow, do you catch what? Paul just said there. And then in Romans 10 that we read, verse 14, he goes, but how, how can they hear 
How can they hear this, this love of God, this incredible message of a God who is terrified of losing them unless somebody proclaims him? Unless somebody proclaims him. And if you look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15, this was after Jesus had been raised from the dead and he had appeared to the women and now he appears to the disciples who are gathered around the table and Jesus looks at them and he goes, now go into the world and proclaim the euangelion. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim this good news. So when we put up as then one of the tenets of our faith will be able to proclaim the gospel with grace, it's not because it's something that we think is a good idea. It's actually something that Jesus commanded us to do. Now go and proclaim the gospel. But how do we do it? Well, we do it with grace. And I think we've made it so complicated. We've actually become terrified of it. But it happens all the time, and you actually are involved with it more than you think. Because like right now, for example, right now, because I'll, I'll be leaving here in just a few moments, going back over to our 11 o'clock service. And when I go in, I kind of go in through the children's wing to get to the choir room to put on a robe to then go up to the sanctuary. You should just go through the children's wing sometime. It is the coolest thing. They, they're in there. It is noisy. But there are people in there who are sitting down with these children, doing skits with children, going through things with children, proclaiming the gospel with grace. Did you realize that's what they're doing? They're proclaiming the gospel with grace. We just said just a moment ago with this child that we would do everything that we could do to nurture that faith and help lead him to someday accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And one of the ways we do that is we'll proclaim the gospel of grace. That's why we do Bible school. It's proclaiming the gospel of grace. That's what we're doing in here. We're telling them about this Jesus who loves them desperately. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the preschool will fill up the building. And it's the coolest thing because there will be teachers and others who are here with all these children proclaiming the gospel with grace you know we're doing it right we're already doing some of this with our youth ministry we we were just talking about joanna being part of the youth ministry and brad and our youth leaders and our youth are absolutely incredible because they're actually leading us in worship which i think is absolutely awesome but one of the things that happens is that we are proclaiming the gospel with grace Adult Sunday school teachers, what do you think that is? Is proclaiming the gospel of grace. Life group leaders, we're proclaiming the gospel of grace, sharing that. The, the sports ministry that we have here in this building and on the fields behind us, why do we do that? It's part of our proclaimed ministry because all these families come and, and, and the kids get to play and have this amazing time, but then the coaches also proclaim the gospel of grace and share with them. And let me tell you, how much your God loves you and he's terrified of ever losing you like any parent with any of their children. Wow, to be loved like that? So one of the reasons we have what we call our silent witness program, it, it's not just a promo of the church. That's not the point at all. And you notice that Justin had his shirt on and, and, and others of you wear them. And we call it silent witness because without ever saying a word, when you have on a, like a church shirt or a, a ball cap that has the name of the church on it, or you're on the golf course with a golf shirt on or whatever it might be, without saying a word, you said, I'm a Christian. Here's where I go to church. That's why we call it silent witness. You didn't open your mouth. But you were witnessing, this is who I am. I love to wear my shirt like that. Or I just ordered some new ones. And uh, I'll go to the grocery store or something. I don't go through the self-checkout if I can help it because you don't get to talk to a person that way. So, you know, you got to go through the one where you actually get to see a human being so that you can actually engage with somebody. And periodically, somebody will see me with that shirt on and they'll go, so do you go to that church over there? And I go, I'm pretty active. And, and what I love is it'll open up the door so many times. Could you pray for my mother? She just found out she has cancer. Can you? And all of a sudden, the door opens. And it wasn't in your face. It wasn't a, if you were to die tonight conversation. It wasn't a turn or burn kind of conversation. It opened the door for somebody to have a conversation about Jesus Christ. 
You can do it as well on your social media. We want to talk about how easy evangelism, evangelism couldn't get any easier than it is today. Many of you do this amazing job, and I love it when I look at your profiles and stuff because you'll put on there, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a Christian mother, a Christian father, uh, whatever it might be that you say that you are, you know, I'm a youth who loves Christ, and, and, and you just kind of share those things, and, and you just kind of lay it out there, I'm a, I'm a Christian. So I am. When you like things that the church is doing, it sends out a note to your friends, hey, this was kind of neat to me. Or you can even click going, like at church, you can click that I'm going to church, and it tells your friends they're going to church, like, y'all come. It, it, you couldn't make evangelism easier than it is today if we'll do it. Now, I, I love football, and, and of course, you know, I've, I've got the Panthers helmets and stuff like that in my office. I do have a, a, a light black, black cloth laid over it now, but... Um, <laughs> I hope to remove that soon. But, you know, like at the Super Bowl, wasn't it kind of cool that, you know, you had quarterbacks that you knew were Christian? Now, how did you know they were Christian? I mean, people talked about it. His faith is important to him. How do we know that? Because they were willing to say it. Did you catch that? How did you know that Brock Purdy is a Christian because he was willing to tell you? where Patrick Mahomes was willing to go out and kneel down behind the goalpost and pray for about 30 minutes before the game and tell you his relationship to God is important. Does that mean that he's perfect? Absolutely not. Does it mean I'm perfect? Absolutely not. But does it mean we're on the journey? Absolutely. How did we know? Because somebody was willing to say, I am a Christian. That's called proclaiming the gospel, but with grace. Gary McIntosh wrote a book called Growing God's Church, and he did some study about how people actually come to faith today. And, and did you know that the studies show that still today, not quite as strong as it was in the past, but still today, the primary way that people come to faith in Jesus Christ is through their family and friends. Did you catch that? The primary way that people come to faith in Christ it's through their family and friends. Did you know that the primary way that people come to faith in Christ is through their family and their friends? And do you know what that means? You've got some family and friends who are desperately waiting for you to let them know you are a Christian and open up the door to let them know that God is terrified of losing them. Wow. They're counting on us. You see, they're counting on us. Now, 17% of the people said they're led to faith in Christ by church staff, like the clergy, and by the youth ministers, and Sunday school teachers, and life group leaders, and youth group leaders, and, and all kinds of others who help lead us to Christ. It's powerful and important, but it's about just being honest, having honest conversation. For example, he, he writes in his book, he said, people said that it was simply conversation, not anything hard. They just had a spiritual conversation with a family member or a friend or a staff member. He said, it seems as though people are coming to faith through natural conversations and discussions. People don't want to feel like they're being led through some sort of rote presentation. All right, now, all right, the first thing you do, step one, step one is to make sure that you confess. People don't want to necessarily be taken through a PowerPoint, right? Right? Not a right presentation. He said, they want to feel that it's more natural. They're just talking among friends about life and sports and spiritual things. And through the conversation, they come to understand what Christianity is and what commitment to Christ is. And some people just all of a sudden say, I believe. And it's not necessarily that they pay, pray a particular prayer or something, though some do. But at times they just say, you know, I've thought about this and we've talked about this. And 
I've come to believe it. He said, so it's a process toward faith, but it happens more in just normal conversation. Well, my point of sharing that with you is nobody's asking you to do this. Good evening. If we would just talk to our families and our friends, if I spoke to mine and you spoke to yours and to your neighbors and we all did it, pretty soon those circles would continue to the point that we have taken the gospel to the world. To the world. C.S. Lewis said that the church exists for nothing else than to draw people into Christ. To make them little Christ, which he means disciples. And if they're not doing that, he said, then all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time because God became human for no other purpose than to lead his children into a relationship with him. Martin Luther said it's the duty of every Christian to be Christ to their neighbor. Did you catch that? It's the duty of every Christian to be Christ to their neighbor. Billy Graham said one of the greatest priorities of the church today is to mobilize the laity to the work of evangelism. One of my friends and mentors used to always say that the church is the one institution that exists for the people that are not yet in it. Our, our God desperately loves the world. And I want you to hear something. God is calling Code Pink. Do you hear me? God is calling Code Pink because he is terrified that he is about to lose a child that he loves more than anything in the world. And he's calling on us not to rest until we help him find them. Will you pray with me? God, the church has had a tendency to throw away the word evangelism because we're repulsed by the way some do it. And yet, that's the commission you give to all of us is to proclaim the euangelion, the gospel, the good news to be messengers of good news, to be the messengers of Christ. And God, our family and our friends are depending on it. And God, you are depending on us, your church, to help make sure that none of your children are lost. Code pink. Amen. Grander earth is quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all, through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well with me Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see 
and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my Sometimes it can be scary or intimidating to share our faith, to proclaim the good news. You know, when I'm coaching football, every time I step onto the practice field, I pray 
I prayed this prayer. It's actually a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. And I encourage you to think through this this week. I pray, Lord, give me the courage to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in everything that I say. And when necessary, use words. So I want to encourage you to do that this, this week. Think about how we act, how we live. You can proclaim your faith without ever speaking a word for the world to see in his name.